testosterone levels worldwide are plummeting. Free testosterone levels specifically was down 45% from 20 years ago. So this age matched. Age matched. Age matched. That means a 50 year old guy today has a free testosterone that's about almost half what it was 20, 30 years ago. And that's a massive decline in our hormone levels. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. David Perlmutter. Welcome again to The Empower Neurologist. Today we're gonna to talk about two very interesting topics with uh, my guest, Dr. Tracy Gappin. Uh, we're gonna be talking about testosterone replacement in men. Uh, yes, you can replace testosterone in women as well when they're low, but also we are going to focus on what are called the GLP-1 agonist drugs. These are the very popular weight loss drugs that we're hearing so much about, drugs like Ozempic, for example. There are several others on the market. We're going to uh, ask Dr. Gappin to review these topics. He is a urologist, but let me tell you a little bit more about him. Dr. Tracy Gappin is a board-certified urologist, men's health and performance expert, and founder of the Gappin Institute, a global leader in high-performance medicine. He has over 20 years of experience focused on providing executives, entrepreneurs, and athletes a personalized path to optimizing their health so they can have exceptional energy laser-focused minds, and a better body. Dr. Gappin attended Texas A&M University and went to Medical School University of Texas Southwestern in Dallas, and he completed his general surgery and urology training at the University of Florida. He spent almost 20 years in a very busy urology practice in Sarasota, Florida, where he specialized in robotic surgery, as well as minimally invasive surgery for the prostate and men's health before opening the Gappin Institute. He is a fellow of the American College of Surgeons and a member of the American Academy of Anti-Aging. He is a thought leader, a professional speaker, and author of the best-selling books, Male 2.0 and Codes of Longevity. So let's jump right into our podcast. Hello, Dr. Gappin, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks so much, David. You know, I'm, I'm still getting used to calling it the show, I should say the podcast, but anyhow, uh, I am really very excited to talk today about male hormone replacement therapy. I mean, you know, the notion of female hormone replacement therapy, it dates back to Prem and Provera. It was sort of like the thing uh, that we've, we've known about for probably 50 years. Uh, but the notion of replacing hormones or bringing them up to a, a certain level in men, I think still doesn't have too, very much traction. Although, you know, we did see commercials for low T when people were advertising this or that supplement. But what is the story? I mean, uh, where should we be in terms of getting our arms around the notion that men should consider fixing their hormone status as well? Sure. Yeah, great question. So first, I think it's important to look at the literature. And there are three longitudinal studies, one here in the U.S. and two from Europe, Sweden and Finland. And each of those three studies were longitudinal studies looking at large populations over decades, 20 to 30 years. And specifically what they found related to this topic was that testosterone levels worldwide are plummeting. Free testosterone levels specifically was down 45% from 20 years ago. So this age point, matched, age matched, age matched. That means a 50 year old guy today has a free testosterone. That's about almost half what it was 20, 30 years ago. And that's a massive decline in our hormone levels. And if you look at, the, the labs that you get from your doctor, the reference range on the right side of the screen there, we'll, sh we'll say reference range. I think it's important first to, to explain what that means. That reference range is not normal, optimal, ideal, where you should be. It is what? It's the average. It's simply right. the statistical average of LabCorp Quest does a million, a billion testosterone levels. And what's the median? And then two standard deviations statistically above and below that median gives you that ridiculous range. Because we're seeing levels plummet so much, this is why you're seeing two things. Number one, you see this massive, huge range. It'll say like 220 to 860 or something dumb like that. And then guys will be on the bottom end of that range and they're being told by their doctors that they're normal, that they're fine, or you don't qualify for testosterone. So we're looking at 
a, a, an average versus what is optimal. And I think that exactly you right. really That's you right. talked about in, in your book, and that is that um, you know we need to be optimized. Men need to be optimized. Right. You use the term twice now called free testosterone. Could you just yeah. let our uh, viewers sure. know what that means and why it's important? Yeah. So for testosterone to have any actual biologic, physiologic effect, it has to get into the cell. Okay. The way testosterone works is it binds to the androgen receptor on the surface of a cell that causes a cascade of events inside the cell that then goes to the nucleus and it causes a change in DNA transcription. And that ultimately leads to a change in protein formation and an actual physiologic result. So it has to get into the cell. Otherwise it can't have any effect. Now, testosterone is mostly bound to proteins in the bloodstream, especially a protein called sex hormone binding globulin or SHBG. And when it's bound to proteins like SHBG, it's suddenly this big fluffy cloud-like molecule that can no longer bind to the androgen receptor, in which case it doesn't help you at all. It's worthless. And so what we care about is not the total testosterone, but specifically the free testosterone. And that means the testosterone molecules that are not bound to any of these proteins in the blood that prevent it from doing its job. And so when you get your labs done, it's important to not check only check total, but the free as well. But generally, when people might go to their doctor and say, I'd like you to check my testosterone, they're going to get the total. They're not going to get it broken down into, to into bound yeah. and unbound or yeah, available. You're you're exactly right. And I've seen so many men where their total testosterone level may actually look okay, not bad. But then when you check the free, holy cow, the sex hormone binding globulin levels were so high that it was binding up all the testosterone and you have very little free available to actually do its job. Yeah. So free is the active. And I think what you just described was what you found when we did my blood work. And that is that my total was great because I had a pretty high uh, sex hormone binding globulin. Yeah, there you go. That the available functional mm -hmm. testosterone, the free, was not where ideal for That's right. what I wanted or you wanted for me. And uh, yeah. as such, we, we start some replacement. Uh, but yeah. that said, let's get back to then, um, why are levels across the board falling? Yeah, a lot of reasons, a lot of explanations. In my opinion, however, the biggest culprit without question is uh, – a, a, what's called endocrine disruptors, which is toxins in our environment. Okay. I would agree. And for the listener, an endocrine disruptor is simply any chemical toxin, toxicant that affects hormone or endocrine function. Now that can affect the production of that hormone. It can affect the receptor for that hormone. It can affect how that hormone does its job, many different mechanisms of action. But we know from, from dozens of published studies that there are toxins in our environment and our food and our drinking water and our personal care products that are directly affecting testosterone production, especially in men, that I believe is the biggest culprit. What's even worse, and we could talk about examples of that, but what's even worse, what's, what's a little scary, is there's this concept called transgenerational epigenetics. What that means is exposures that our grandparents had to these toxins affected their DNA. It caused marks on their DNA, which is this epigenetics, the science of how our, our environment and lifestyle affects our genetic expression. That can actually get passed on through generations. So your grandparents got it. It was passed on to your parents. You have these marks on your DNA, which is affecting testosterone production in this case, and that can get passed on to your children. And so mm. it's not only the exposures that we are dealing with in our current present day, but our ancestors as well. And that's where you start to see, unfortunately, this, this escalating effect. You know, interestingly, that is a very powerful survival mechanism on, you know, the positive side of that is that experiences that our uh, previous generations had uh, would change our genetic expression via the, what you just described in a way to be more salubrious for us in our, in our lifetimes and protect our health to some degree. Uh, in a sense, our DNA would learn about the environment and make appropriate changes. Uh, but in this case, with these uh, xenohormonal uh, uh, influences, I mean, many of our viewers have heard of xenoestrogens, pro yeah. products in the environment like you described, mm -hmm. that can act as estrogen mimetics or similar to estrogen. But I think that the notion that toxins in the environment are mimicking or in uh, inactivating the way testosterone works, binds the receptor yeah. in such a way that true testosterone cannot do its job, Scary proposition, you know, uh, uh, sperm counts are down dramatically globally and sperm motility is down dramatically. So, you know, it doesn't bode well for, for even for reproduction. So, 
Uh, I think that your discussion then about the importance of testing and looking at free, you know, has ratcheted up to even a higher level. So what are some of the things then that men, let's say you don't test, but what are some of the clues that maybe testosterone levels are not where they need to be? Yeah. So some of the common signs and symptoms we see in men who have issues with low testosterone, and I'd be willing to, to bet that almost any man listen to this, if you haven't had your levels checked, you probably have lower levels than you need. It, it has become unfortunately ubiquitous. And and like you mentioned, you know, uh, fertility has declined a similar, like you said, 50% or so, which matches the, the curves if you look at the studies of testosterone as well. So there's clearly an effect on those germ cells on, on the testicular um, interstitial and, and uh, Leydig cells. Um, but the signs and symptoms we see in, in men may be none at all, maybe so subtle that guys don't even realize it. It may be a, uh, a energy decline where I don't, hey, listen, doc, you know, I'm okay in the morning, but by early afternoon, I'm exhausted. I want to take a nap. If I hear a guy tell me they want to take a nap, that's a sign something's not right. You can debate whether naps are good or bad, but if e even you're after pickleball, <laughs> well, that's different. If you've exercised, but I'm talking about how guys will say they want to take a nap. And, and when your hormone levels are optimized, you shouldn't want to take a nap. Let me put it that way. So there's something not quite right if you're wanting to take a nap, especially at two or three in the afternoon. So decreased energy fatigue, especially later in the day. Um, issues with concentration, mental focus, acuity, cognitive function. Um, guys talk about this brain fog that they can suffer when their testosterone levels aren't optimized. They just don't have the same um, mental um, capacity as they normally did. Um, they may have issues with weight gain, especially around the belly. You know, the, the, um, uh, the, the belly fat, the, you know, pinch an inch or two is you walk down the street, you see it everywhere. And there's oh this gosh, yeah. problem called metabolic syndrome, which is a confluence of, of, of other uh, issues associated with low testosterone. Um, it's becoming incredibly common. Over three quarters of, of adults in the U.S. are either overweight or obese, and and you see that trunkal obesity in these guys with low testosterone, and it's because you know your, your engine is not running at full strength. You don't have the metabolism you did when your hormone levels were optimized. So weight gain is a problem. A lot of guys struggle with poor sleep with low testosterone, and that can actually go both ways, where low testosterone can beget poor quality sleep. And poor quality sleep has been shown in several studies to crush testosterone production as well. So that actually goes both ways. Um, guys have, I hear a lot, guys have difficulty with recovery from an injury or from, you know, they, they play pickleball, let's say, or they, they play tennis or they play some sort of um, physical uh, um, challenging sport. And the next day their body is a wreck and it takes two or three or four days to recover from that. So the recovery is not the same. Um Sex drive is a big issue with guys with low testosterone where um, previously they were chasing their wife around. Now their wife is chasing them around and the wife's like, hey, what's wrong? Why isn't he interested? Is he not attracted to me? Is he cheating on me? And it can create all kinds of, of social dynamics because his sex drive has changed. Uh, it can also affect sexual performance, of course, where uh, a man's erection quality is not what it was. Performance is not like what it was when he was younger as well. And um, how about muscle mass? Yeah, muscle mass can definitely decline or uh, the bigger challenge there is guys say, I can't build muscle like I could before. I'm working out hard in the gym. I'm working out harder than ever, doc, but I can't build muscle. I can't burn fat no matter what I do. And and that's that metabolic syndrome where, you know, think of it, your, your engine's off. Your engine's not running at full speed. And so you don't have the metabolism, the ability to, you know, you're in a, in a catabolic state rather than an anabolic state like you need to be. Um, and so, yeah, um, Muscle mass, bone density are all intimately associated with, with optimal hormone levels as well. You know, you uh, hinted at something that uh, I think you're saying that low testosterone leads to, may lead to poor sleep, which can compromise testosterone level, both of which can lead to general feelings of fatigue and other issues, even cognitive. But, you know, this seems to me uh, of all the things that can uh, befall us this, uh, these days, like long COVID, uh, like metabolic issues. But this is pretty much the low hanging fruit in terms of getting uh, offloading this one off the table in terms of checking the box and, and fixing it. Yeah. And it seems to me that uh, when you, when a patient comes in and complains of not the maybe not the whole laundry list, but some of these things you light up and say could be low testosterone, do your blood test, yeah. low free testosterone, that it's a pretty straightforward. Uh, I hate to say easy fix in medicine because people yeah. kind of recoil at that, but it seems at least to be fair, straightforward, that now you see a patient, everything fits, 
blood work works and you're going to start to replete the testosterone. So how do you go about that? Yeah. And let me, let me, if I can, David, just to honor uh, the natural holistic approach first, because I get this question a lot where guys say, well, can't I just do some natural stuff? What can I do naturally? I don't want to do just, I don't want to do something synthetic. I'm not sure if it's a pharmaceutical, you know, there's all kinds of hesitation there. So let me, let me answer that, that objection or challenge first. Um, when guys come in for the first time and we're checking free tea, our target there is around 20, maybe 25, maybe as high as 30, but our target is around 20 or higher for the most part. When guys come in off the street, having never checked a level before, a lot of times it'll be six or seven, something like wow. that. It'll be super low. And they'll have all the signs and symptoms we talked about a moment ago. What can we do naturally to boost that up, doctor? What, what can I do to not take testosterone? Sure, we can do resistance training, heavy strength training, especially with the big belly muscles like our quads, our hamstrings, our back, our core muscles. Um, we can make sure we're eating healthy fats to support cholesterol, which is the precursor to testosterone production. We can reduce stress because we know cortisol or stress hormone crushes testosterone production. So if we can reduce cortisol levels or stabilize them, we can improve our sleep quality. If we can clean up our gut, if we can do all of these things, yes, those will definitely help testosterone. Make sure we have the right micronutrients and so on. So all those things absolutely 100% support those. Those are great. That's going to get your free testosterone level from six to about nine and a half. Awesome. Now let's talk about TRT. Yeah. So that's a common uh, uh, complaint or concern that we hear. So I want to just emphasize that I absolutely support doing all those things. And we need to move on to TRT in most cases because the natural stuff is never going to get you to where you need to be. Yeah. So that being said, um, the conversation around, around TRT is, look, your body's not making the testosterone it needs, right? It will never make the testosterone it needs no matter what you do because of what we talked about, toxins and stress and everything else in our, in our environment and previous generations, et cetera. One way or another, we need to give you testosterone to get it where it needs to be. And it is low-hanging fruit, David. It's fairly straightforward. It has a, a very quick effect. You know, when guys start testosterone therapy, within a week or two, they feel a difference. The energy changes, the drive, the mood. All I, of it just changes. I'm here to tell you, athletic performance especially and yeah. uh, strength training. Yeah. So uh, increased tell, strength. Yeah. Tell them more about your experience with that. I think that'd be great. Well, I, I you know, I, I work out very hard and I began noticing, I think it's what you and I talked the first time we connected is I'm working out harder and making less gains mm -hmm. and, um, you know, it was a simple tweak. I kind of had a sense of, as you know, we talked about it yeah. and I had some reluctance, but pursued it. And we're going to talk about what, where that came from and why it was unfounded. Uh, but I've noted, you know, I'm adding weight to resistance training and my and endurance. And uh, I'm not a force yet on the rec on the pickleball court, but I will be one day, but you know, I'm certainly glad that I did it. But, and I, I think, you know, you, your book is says uh, the subtitle personalized data driven age reversal. I like the part about data driven because, you know, this isn't a shot in the dark. You're testing the testosterone on free and you're making adjustments and you're going to retest to see, do we overshoot? Do you need a little bit more? And, you know, ultimately fine tune that individual based on his uh, symptoms and what he's describing and based on the blood work. So it's data driven. I love that. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I, I love talking about testosterone. We can do this all day. This is fantastic. I, I just want to be sure that I emphasize as well that, as amazing as testosterone is, as important as it is, and as dramatic a, a change you'll notice immediately, it's also important to emphasize the fact that um, most men, when there's issues with testosterone, there's issues with one of the other 50 hormones as well. Thyroid, vitamin D, nitric oxide, melatonin, estrogen, progesterone, it's, it goes on and on. And so I want to make sure that we talk about the fact that there's a lot of other issues that come into play. They often have issues with the gut and then the gut brain connections affecting neurotransmitters and they have inflammation and blood sugar regulation problems. And so I want to just honor that as incredible as testosterone is, I don't want to come across as that's the be all end all for men's health. I think that's really good. You know, there, w there's always that tendency uh, in this world that in which we live, the health related world, for the be all end all, you know, there's yeah. a while it was HGH, human growth hormone, right. was the cat's meow. And, you know, to be fair, there's a lot of talk about the, the um, Ozempic type drugs. Mm -hmm. And I think there's certainly, you know, some good conversation to be had about that. And maybe yeah. uh, we'll be able to, you know, touch upon that later on in our time together today. But um, any 
when you are putting a patient on testosterone replacement therapy, do you have a discussion about potential downsides or risks? For sure. Yeah. It, you know, obviously informed consent, whenever we start any new uh, hormone medication, supplement, anything, we have that conversation. And uh, the, the, the main two concepts to be sure we talk about here relate to testosterone or cardiovascular risk or not risk or and prostate cancer risk or not risk. And so let's look at cardiovascular first. What we know from, gosh, over a dozen, maybe 20 studies now is that men with low testosterone have an increased risk of a major adverse cardiac event, meaning heart attack, stroke, or death. 30% in some studies difference. And if you look at men with low testosterone versus higher testosterone levels, you know, quartiles, men with low testosterone have a massively elevated risk of cardiovascular disease in the lower end of the group of the, the levels. Now, we also know that when you give testosterone, that reduces, it does not increase. The, the risk of cardiovascular disease reduces. LDL numbers go down. Triglycerides go down. Insulin resistance improves. Inflammatory markers improve. All with simply getting your testosterone levels where they need to be. Now, why is there so much controversy? There were two studies that got published. This is back in my urology days, maybe, gosh, about almost 10 years ago now. And these two crappy studies got so much attention that they changed the industry um, until recently. One of the studies was a retrospective study looking at prescription data, simply Men who were prescribed testosterone and did they die? Didn't look at it, didn't look at levels, didn't look at anything else other than did they get a testosterone prescription and did they die? Yeah. The other study, the vegan study, had women in it. Had women in the study. And when you actually looked at the raw data, it showed the same thing every other study has shown a 30% reduction in major adverse cardiac events. Yet the conclusions of the, of the study was the exact opposite that it increased risk. But there were 130 or something international medical communities that called for the retraction of that article, and it never it, it did not get retracted, unfortunately. And so that led to a lot of hesitation. The, the, the medical community is now fearful of testosterone all because of those, really that one crappy study. And so we have so many studies since then that have shown the exact opposite, what we know to be true. Uh, there was the Traverse trial, which just got released uh, end of November, so not long ago, and that showed the same thing that we just shared, a reduced risk of cardiovascular disease as well as a reduced risk of prostate cancer, which we'll talk about next as well. So when we look at prostate cancer, there was one study with one patient in 1941, right. and this study showed, this, this case study included one man who was castrated and they found that his prostate acid phosphatase, PAP, but this is way before PSA was around, his PAP levels dropped. And so they found in this man that castration treats prostate cancer. Fantastic. So men with advanced prostate cancer, they're castrated and it suppresses the prostate cancer from growing. That's been a therapy since 1941. Because of that, however, we assumed Testosterone must be bad for cancer. No testosterone must be good for prostate cancer. And that led to the perpetuation of this false concept. Even when I went through my urology training and for 25 years in practice, that testosterone is like gasoline on the fire kind of concept. We now know that to be completely false. We now know from several studies that include the tra traverse trial that just came out a few months ago, support this, that men with no cancer, no history of cancer, who are given testosterone, have no increased risk of developing prostate cancer than the general population, about one in six, one in seven or so. That does not change. Men who have been treated already for cancer, they've had surgical removal or radiation therapy, who have low testosterone and are given testosterone therapy, had no increased risk of progression or recurrence of their disease. And even more fascinating, and I see this in my practice, Men who have untreated prostate cancer, we're talking about low-grade, non-aggressive 
indolent cancer that we manage with what's called active surveillance, meaning we don't, we're not going to aggressively treat it. The, the, the harm is worth more than the benefit of treating these cancers. And those men who have low testosterone and are given testosterone therapy saw no increased incidence of progression of their cancers. Hmm. And so we now recognize that, yes, for advanced cancers, castration will suppress that cancer as well as suppress quality of life. But giving testosterone does not stimulate or promote growth of prostate cancer. Well, hi, everyone. Dr. David Promoter here. Uh, we hope you're enjoying this content. And if you would do so, go ahead and hit the like button. And if you're not already a subscriber to our channel, please consider doing so. Uh, we're really grateful to have you as part of our community. So let's get right back to the presentation. Well, interestingly, um, you know, there are uh, drug uh, approaches used for growth of the prostate, like finasteride uh, for a man who have prostate symptomatology, right. uh, difficulty with urination, right. and frequent, frequency, uh, nocturia, et cetera, for yeah. being at night. So here we are trying to block the active form of testosterone by giving a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. And how does that factor into this whole notion of testosterone that you've just described? Yeah, so testosterone is an androgen, obviously. It's a, it's a steroid hormone. And it gets converted by the enzyme you just mentioned into DHT or dihydrotestosterone. DHT is a much more potent, it's a stronger androgen, stronger hormone than testosterone. And it has a much stronger effect specifically on prostate growth. So the prostate is uh, an organ in men, obviously, just below the bladder. And, it, and it's shaped like a donut, if you will, around the urethra, the urine channel. And as you age, as you get older, the prostate grows. And that donut grows and grows and it grows outward, but it also grows inward and obstructs or constricts the lumen, the urethra, which causes a lot of the, the symptoms that men have with enlarged prostate. Different than cancer. We're talking about enlargement, benign enlargement mm -hmm. of the prostate. DHT is the most um, notable hormone that causes that growth. So drugs like Proscar, Avidar, drugs that block the conversion of testosterone to DHT are suppressing that DHT hormone from stimulating prostate growth. Unfortunately, that also has effect on sexual function. And so that's why that's not a clean drug that we'd necessarily like to use. And there's been, I think, quite a bit of discussion that using a, a drug like Proscar or Propecia on your scalp to grow hair back uh, for this male pattern baldness yeah. that some of us get <laughs> is uh, will have an effect on the PSA that uh, it may uh, falsely reduce the PSA. And in a way, if you're relying on the PSA for detection of cancer, or at least the, its trajectory, that might be an issue. Uh, I mean, is that well known? Is that something so, that people take into consideration yeah. when looking at the lab value? Yeah, we've known that for, for several decades where uh, whenever a man is on any of those drugs, the PSA will be lowered by a factor of 2.2. And so if you came in and your PSA was one and you're on Proscar, Avidart, Finasteride, I would multiply that one by 2.2 and that's your actual true PSA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So you, uh, people should take that into account. Right. And let's get into then the mechanics of uh, you've tested a patient. He is low, clinically fits the criteria. We're going to move ahead now with treatment. What does that involve and, and what is monitoring like? Sure. So there are, in general, three ways to take testosterone, maybe a four, three and a half ways, we'll say. Um, the first way and the way that we typically recommend is injectable. And injectable is ideal because you can give it on a periodic basis and it will slowly release over time. You can give injectable either intramuscular, which was the approach for a long time until the last five years or so, where we now recognize that subcutaneous injection can get you the same levels for most men, maybe 90, 95% of men can get the same serum levels with sub Q as you can with intramuscular. Sub Q is attractive and appealing because you can use a small insulin needle and you barely even feel it at all. Whereas I am intramuscular, it, it's just a little more sensitive. But either way, we typically um, suggest intra, uh, injectable testosterone as first line option. And um, the key here is more often the better. So when you inject, and gosh, back in my urology days, as ignorant as we were, we were doing it once every two weeks, which now is, is almost a crime. 
um, because you get those, those big peaks and valleys until your next injection. We like to recommend two or three times a week in general. And what that will do is it'll get you to a steady state where your levels become very consistently uh, within a very tight window. And you can regulate that level exactly where you want it by just simply varying or tweaking the dose of the injection. So the more frequent, the better. And the more frequent, obviously, the lower the dose you would give as well. Um, but we definitely do not want to be doing it once a week. We don't want to be doing it once every other week. It needs to be at least twice a week to be sure we're getting consistent levels without the big peaks and valleys that you'll otherwise get. Okay. What happens if you overdo it? What happens if levels get, is there a too high? So um, if you ask a bodybuilder, no, <laughs> it's never too high. Um, but do you need it that high? The answer is probably not. So the most common symptom guys may get from levels that are a little higher than you want, uh, maybe acne, especially on your back, your chest, your back, your shoulders. Um, it can cause um, increase in blood pressure when levels are, are high as well. For some guys, if the level's too high, you can see a five or 10 point increase in blood pressure. So that's notable. Um, this whole concept of roid rage and and it's going to make you change behavior and and beat your wife it's all nonsense it's not going to change your behavior um if you have higher levels it's going to put you in a more anabolic state like again bodybuilders we don't necessarily want to be that high um and so the goal is to the sweet spot is to get you to a high level where you feel the benefits but not too high where you start to have some of the anabolic effects you don't necessarily want or need and how topical, how effective is topical like a gel? Sure. So, uh, so first injectable, the second one is topical. And, um, I, I, I like topical for some men who don't want to use needles. Um, the gels are in general, not great option. And I'll tell you why the gels are alcohol based gels. They're far, they're, they're pharma based. They're like, um, the, the testum, the fortesta, the, the androderm, the androgel, these are uh, alcohol-based topicals that you put on your on your upper chest, on your shoulder, on your arm up here, and it gets absorbed through the skin. You're supposed to put on them every morning, and by the next day, it's completely worn off. So it's important to note that with topical, you have to use it every single day, or you'll lose your levels will plummet back to where they were before. And so um, that's the key is to use them every day. The alcohol-based ones, like you asked about the gels, I have never been able to get guys levels where they need to be with the gels so for example i'll get that guy with nine and a half up to maybe 14 13 14 around there i can't get him up to 20 as hard as i sometimes try now i can use a topical cream a testosterone a versa based cream that you actually apply on the scrotum and we do that because the absorption through the scrotal skin is remarkable and i can get levels through the roof with a very small amount of topical on the scrotum every morning and so first option typically is injectable. The second option would be a Versa-based cream to the scrotum every morning. And that's typically effective for most guys to get levels where you want to be as well. Um, it becomes a personal choice for some. Some guys won't absorb topical. Um, you also can get a little more issues with, um, with estrogen conversion and um, DHT conversion with topical. So that may be an issue for some guys, but certainly a viable option as a second choice. Sure. And oral? So uh, the third one will be pellets. Um, oral, there are, um, in Europe, a lot of people, a lot of uh, physicians use oral. There's always been a concern about da effect to the liver, damage to the liver. Uh, there's a new drug. First pass. Yeah, first pass effect to the liver. Um, there's a, a new drug that just got released uh, here in the U.S., FDA approved, and um, they've been trying to get me to use it, and I won't use it because all the studies show that, again, you can't get the levels to where you need it to be uh, with that oral dose. And so mm -hmm. I, I, I have that as a very, very last bottom of the line resort. Um, and I just don't think you need that. I think most guys with either sub Q injectable or daily topical, you, you don't feel it at all. And so um, they're, they're both pretty easy options. The third option would be a pellet. And pellets are a long-term solution where uh, we numb up a small spot in the buttock or in the upper back. Uh, numb, numb up a small little a spot, make a puncture. And we're talking like half a centimeter or so. And through that little puncture, we put a trocar. And inside that trocar, I can pass a bunch of little tiny little pellets. And these pellets are, they look like rabbit food almost. And you can put in pellets that will release testosterone over a long period of time. So you can put in pellets that will last for four months. 
Wow. So it's a great option. If, for example, if guys in the military are traveling overseas and he's not going to be around, he's not going to be able to treat himself on a regular basis, that might be a good option. Um, so pellets are a nice long-term option. The challenge with pellets is the absorption of those pellets can sometimes vary. Meaning I could put pellets, I could put 12 pellets in you today and get a, get a, a free tea of 18. Next time I could put in 12 pellets and get a free tea of 12. And then following time I can get a free tea of 22. And so the absorption and the levels that you get can sometimes vary, which makes that challenging. So um, is it varying awesome. individual or individual, or you think there's a, a quality yeah. control issue of the pellet or just the thickness of the subcutaneous? Maybe, maybe all of the above. Yeah. Maybe all the, there's just so many different variables that it's tough to uh, attribute what that change is. And so I don't love pellets. Um, I, I try to go with one of those first two options because with the injectable, the topical, I can get very, very tightly controlled levels with those. And, and, and we know, what dosing you need. We know how you're responding to it with simple blood testing. Um, and there's a much more efficient way of, of dosing it. Yeah. Is there ever a need for replacement of estrogen and or progesterone in men? Great question. Um, estrogen, no. Um, progesterone, no. So um, in, in when it comes to estrogen, first of all, uh, the opposite has always been thought true. It's been thought that estrogen is the enemy. You know, you have these bodybuilders, especially in the, the bro science community who are taking drugs that will block the metabolism or break down testosterone into estradiol. By blocking that conversion, they're crushing their estrogen levels because they think estrogen is bad for them and testosterone is good. And so they're trying to increase their T levels. In reality, estrogen is not the enemy. Estrogen is very beneficial for cardio. We, we believe that the cardiovascular benefits that we see at testosterone is probably more likely from the estrogen conversion that you have rather than testosterone itself. Don't know that for sure, but we believe that's the case. And that's why, you, you know, we look at the postmenopausal data with women and the benefits of estrogen therapy and um, how bioidentical hormones are, are, are showing improvement in cardiovascular profile for the same reason. Mm -hmm. And so um, estrogen is not the enemy. I've seen so many guys with low estrogen who have issues with mood, depression, low libido, erectile dysfunction from low estrogen. And so um, I don't often block estrogen conversion. I will from time to time, but I'm very selective and I do it very carefully just to lower it slightly without going too far. Um, but I've never had to give a man estrogen though. Yeah. Let me, let me push the envelope a little bit here. Uh, in that uh, upstream from testosterone is cholesterol. Would there be an effect of lipid lowering medication on testosterone availability? Absolutely. Yeah, you, you, that's a pretty consistent finding. Uh, uh, you know, one of the one of the many reasons we hate statins is because of the fact that it crushes pregnenolone, DHEA, testosterone, estradiol, for sure. Hmm. So, would you then a man come to see you and is on a, a statin drug for his cholesterol? You're kind of expecting that testosterone to be low. David, I, I can't say I've seen a guy off the street who had an optimal testosterone level without therapy. It's just, it's unheard really? of in this day and age. It's, 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 it's almost ubiquitous now. Yeah, it, it's crazy. So, I, and I, I'm going to reiterate something uh, for audience because I think it's really very, very important that a 45 year old man 50 years ago would have had a significantly higher testosterone level uh, in comparison to a 45 year old man today probably because of a number of factors, including the rampant rise in metabolic issues, obesity, overweight, but also because of these uh, xenobiotics in the environment, these chemicals in the environment that are wreaking havoc with our hormone functionality and levels. Mm -hmm. So I just want to be very, you know, be very clear to our viewers that it's worth checking. And for women, it's worth checking your hormone situation as right. well, uh, because, you know, Therapy is pretty straightforward and is guided by data, guided by laboratory studies. Right. How does thyroid functionality impact uh, uh, availability and functionality of testosterone? Sure. And if I could add one more thing to that, David, um, what's important to recognize also is you look at that reference range of what we see on the lab now, be aware that that range, based on what you just described, that range was 50% higher 20 years ago. And so when you are in the bottom of that range, you're actually really way outside the range. You're below it. So you need to be at the top end of that range. And that's why I really look at a free T of around 20 as my target. Knowing that that's on the high end of that curve, I'm okay with that because 20 years ago, that was actually the middle of the curve. 
Yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, one thing to say to patients is, do you want to be normal and look around you or do you want to be optimal? There you go. Exactly. So, you know, it's all about optimizing your data and you can't optimize data until you measure the data and acquire it. That's right. Then you know what to do. That's right. So where were we? we can so thyroid, I was like, yes, about thyroid. So I, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, yeah, I see thyroid um, like testosterone as a downstream symptom of an underlying problem. And so uh, I like to emphasize, you know, guys come in for, for low T. I wanted to fix my testosterone. Well, okay. And what's the source of that problem? What's the issue? And so oftentimes we'll see issues with gut inflammation, dysbiosis, candida, whatever that's causing issues with inflammation that then increases cortisol levels, which feed back to the pituitary, shutting off both thyroid and testosterone. And so um, to your point, when guys have low testosterone, um, very commonly we'll see low free T3, low free T4 levels, thyroid hormone levels as well. Yeah. Hmm. So upstream then, we're talking about the influences on the test to actually produce the, uh, uh, testosterone hormone in the first place. That's right. And, you know, I wanted to just add to the list because it'll be on the quiz for our viewers uh, <laughs> that vitamin D's precursor is cholesterol as well. Let's um, let's transition to a very, very hot topic. And this is the GLP-1 agonist drugs, uh, the Ozempic, Semaglutide, uh, uh, Mujorno, um, Mogovi, Munjara rather, uh, Mogovi, and uh, really super popular uh, looking mm-hmm. like these days as a, as a way out. But I think that plenty of, of physicians are using temperance and realizing that these drugs really do have an upside that should not be uh, discarded out of hand that, you know, sig- uh, significant overweight or even obesity is a life threatening condition. Yeah. And that bariatric surgery is interesting and can work for some, mm-hmm. you know, that uh, dietary intervention and uh, lifestyle modification is helpful for some, but that this, uh, there are some upsides. So where do you land? And then we'll take it from there. Yeah, I, I agree with you completely, David, that there are pros and cons to these pharmaceuticals. I think it's important to, to honor the benefit that they provide while also putting an asterisk on, on that. So um, first of all, GLP-1 agonists have obviously gained massive attention in the last year. Um, they were initially um, FDA approved specifically for diabetics until a few years ago when Ozempic was approved for specifically weight loss indication, which was remarkable. Um, and then the compound pharmacies got a hold of it, and now they can make semaglutide with B12, and uh, that's where things really started to take off as well. So what does it do, first of all? The GLP-1 agonists, and, and GLP-1 is actually um, made by the gut. And so a lot of... Uh, you know, chicken or the egg situation where the uh, obese people have issues with bad gut health, low GLP-1, and that affects insulin production and so on. And so it, it's fascinating how um, the gut and the pancreas kind of work together. So what does GLP-1 do? GLP-1 has uh, the effect of regulating blood sugar through a couple of mechanisms. Number one, it increases insulin production efficiency of the pancreas so that um, blood sugar is better regulated by better insulin control of blood sugar. It has a non-insulin dependent way to regulate blood sugar as well by activating um, receptor, GLUT4 receptors on cells that help get blood, get help, help get glucose out of the bloodstream into the cell to lower blood sugar as well. It also acts in the stomach to help slow emptying so you get fuller quicker and you don't eat as much. And fourth, it acts at the brain level to suppress appetites. You're not even hungry in the first place. So multiple ways that it works is pretty remarkable hormone that has a lot of great benefit in terms of weight loss. It's attractive because people can take it and within a couple of weeks start to lose weight, start to have better control of their appetite. And, you know, people... People want easy button, right, Dave? People always looking, give me that magic. Yeah, sure. Give me my shot of testosterone on my GLP-1 shot and I'm out the door. Um, and so, yes, it does help with appetite suppression, hunger and satiety, blood sugar regulation, all those things that has that benefit. But what happens when you stop it? Right. You can't take it forever. And so what happens when you stop it? And I've seen this dozens of times now where patients will take it or they took it elsewhere. They'll take it for three, six, nine months. We'll stop it. I've lost 40 pounds and they gain it all back. 
Yeah, I mean, so, that's been described in the New England Journal that, you know, pretty yeah. much there's a significant. And yeah. the answer has been, well, this keep to stay on the drug. Yeah. And I, I think it comes back. To, and I had this book here. I'm actually uh, obsessed with this book. I'm sharing it with my clients right now. Tiny Habits. BJ Fox, yeah. Tiny Habits. Amazing book. Um, and Atomic Habits is wonderful as well. But it's all about how do we change behavior, human behavior. It starts there. And I like to look at GLP-1 agonists, not as the be-all end-all. There is a great pharmaceutical to use short-term while we are helping to establish real behavioral change by creating consistent daily habits so that when you come off of the semaglutide or tirzepatide or liraglutide, you're now able to survive on your own. Think of it like the floaties when you're a kid in the swimming pool, you're wearing those floaties in your arm for a while. They help you swim, right? They're great but you're not going to wear those forever. Eventually you're going to learn how to swim and you're going to be okay without them. And so that's kind of how I just made that analogy up just now. I may, I may use that again down the road. I like that one. No, I'm going to use it too. <laughs> I just made that up. Um, I love that. But, but the key is, is to think of it as a short term agent to help get you over the hump. It, you know, the key word that I, I like to emphasize is momentum. It gives you momentum. You know, you feel success. Success feels good. Let's go. What's next? How do I improve? How do I get better? And it gets clients to change their perspective. And that's why I love the drug with its limitations. People have side effects, uh, nausea, oh, gastrointestinal yeah. issues are really, really common. What can people do if they're on this type of drug to offset those side effects? Very, very low dose and uh, be very slow to titrate the dosing up. We get great benefits at very low levels, at very low doses. You know, 0.25 milligram, very low dose. We'll get, we'll see results. So you don't need a lot. More is not always better. Um, sometimes when people try to ramp up the dosing too quickly, that's when they get issues with nausea and vomiting, cramping. So if someone does have those symptoms, I would say hold the drug for a week until you, if you feel better a week later, resume it at half the dose. If you're still symptomatic, wait another week. And when you, when you're finally symptomatic, go back to half the dose and stay there for a while. And typically that takes care of it. And there's been a lot of talk about the importance of having protein on board when you take this medication to help offset some of this stuff. Yeah. So one of the, one of the biggest effects of this drug, as I mentioned, is loss of appetite. And I'll see clients who just won't eat for days at a time. Now, in general, when we look at, um, adults here in the U S we have a big problem with carb consumption, too much carbs, not enough protein in general, right? That, that's already a problem that exists. When you now suppress appetite, one of the first things that goes away is that protein, that macro, uh, your protein consumption. And so it's so incredibly important for anyone who's on these GLP-1 agonists that they have to be resilient when it comes to exercise, resistance training, and nutrition, specifically getting enough protein. My target for anyone is a gram of protein per pound of body weight should be your target for protein per day, whether you're fasting or not. And it's tough to do. Kind of ideal body, body weight. weight. Ideal, ideal body weight. Correct. And it, you know, it really seems like people are not getting that much protein. What, why the fear of protein? Um, you know, there's, there's talk about if protein is harmful for you. I, I think it's nonsense. We know without question that you need those building blocks to be able to get protein muscle synthesis. Um, and so um, any, critique of high protein or how much you can absorb, I think is nonsense that you can, you can absorb all the protein you're eating. So I don't think it's an issue there. I think it's honestly, it's carb addiction, David. I mm -hmm. think most people who are, you know, one way to look at this, most people who are taking the GLP-1 agonists are obese. They need to lose weight. Why do they need to lose weight? Typically it's diet. And what's wrong with their diet? Typically it's excess carb consumption, specifically. Yeah, the and, and you just can't, and people can't quit. Yeah. I mean, people binge on carbs, right? Yeah. They just can't quit. That's right. But who binges on avocados? Right. Uh, yeah, who binges protein. on, on steak? Yeah, you know, on, right. on protein. So exactly. I think what you're telling us, we, we need more protein. And this is a way for some people yeah. to gain control. It, it, and, you know, psychologically, now that they've lost X amount of weight, uh, you know, they're feeling good about themselves. And I think that's encouraging to keep going sans the drug. But how common is that? I mean, what are you seeing in terms of people who are able to come off and maintain uh, versus can't come off? So there are semaglutide clinics 
almost everywhere now, it seems. And uh, I would say uniformly, all those patients are failing. Here, we're not seeing those failures because we take a systems approach when it comes to health. And we recognize that um, everything is connected. We understand that, that you cannot look at it in a single faceted perspective. And so when our clients are on semaglutide, we're also working on lifestyle and on mm -hmm. macro tracking and on fitness and on sleep and on stress and checking hormones and looking at cardiovascular health and, and gut health and all these other components. When you fix all those together, that's when you see the real sustainable results. And yeah. so that's the context in which I appreciate the value of GLP-1 agonist. If you're taking it by yourself, going to some clinic, getting a shot, it's not going to work. Certainly not sustainably. Hmm. Wow. Very good advice. Well, listen, Tracy, great to spend time with you. And um, this has been some fantastic information um, for, for everyone. They want to learn more. They can reach out to you. You uh, do virtual uh, consultations. I know I've been there. That's right. And a great book. Uh, is that backwards? Probably going to be backwards. Nope, Mail 2.0. Yeah. Oh, well, backwards yeah. on my screen. Anyhow, that's all right. We know what it says. So thanks. And I hope to see you soon. Hey, thanks so much, Dave. Okay, we'll talk soon. Bye-bye. Wow. Learned a lot about testosterone today, didn't we? And also the uh, GLP-1 agonist. So, you know, Dr. Uh, Gappin, I think, gives a very pragmatic, uh, a very reason-based approach to his use of hormone replacement therapy in men, which, you know, based upon what he was telling us, the fact that testosterone levels have plummeted for the reasons we discussed, I think it's some very sound advice and it's really something that is worth looking into. And certainly the utility of these new uh, GLP-1 agonist drugs uh, has proven itself, uh, but with uh, certain caveats as well. I'm Dr. David Perlmutter. Thank you for joining me on the program today, and I'll be back soon. Bye for now.